Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, a ceasefire ends 11 days of violence in the Middle East. Our team reports from southern Israel near Gaza. Also tonight, Ontario's plan to reopen cautiously. Yes! That's perfect. Couldn't be sooner. But Manitoba has a much different story. We're in the darkest days of this time. A hard-hitting judgment against an infamous television interview. Well, there were three of us in this marriage. And playoff rivalries reignited. After the Oilers and Jets, it's the Habs and Leafs. For the first time since 79. Leafs season is over. The Canadians win it. How's that for a throwback Thursday? This is The National. This is Gaza City tonight. Quiet scene, just hours into a ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants. For 11 days, fighting and fear have gripped people there. Rocket fire and bombs have killed more than 200. Tonight, that ceasefire is cause for hope that the fighting might be done. Just seconds after it went into effect, at 2 a.m. local time, the celebration began in Gaza City. Earlier today, after days of intense international pressure, both sides of the conflict agreed to a proposal put forward by Egypt. Now, Margaret Evans is in Jerusalem tonight, having spent much of the day further south. Margaret, there's agreement on the ceasefire, but not on the details. That's right, uh, not much detail. Um, Israel is saying that this is an unconditional ceasefire. Hamas is insisting that it's won concessions from Israel on Palestinian pressure points in occupied East Jerusalem. None of this is surprising. Both sides are going to be presenting themselves as the victor to their own audiences. The day began with talk of an imminent ceasefire, but hope of it was soon drowned out by the sound of more rocket fire and Israeli warplanes. Here, flying over Ashdod en route to Gaza, some 40 kilometers to the south. Ashdod is in the line of fire for rockets launched from Gaza. The people here are used to it, and it shows. Deputy Mayor Shimon Katzenelson, out surveying damage to an apartment hit earlier in the week, was expecting a ceasefire. We have a strong army, we will stop it. If Hamas will not understand that we, he need to, to do another peaceful policy, they will, will be killed and that, that's all. An elderly couple lived here and were home when the rocket hit. The man is in hospital with injuries to his inner ear, his wife and granddaughter showing us the damage. This was the kitchen. Um, it didn't actually come into the no. building, it just hit the window. Hit and the bounced. window, yes. Hen Gimelfarb is angry with the Israeli government for not providing enough accessible bomb shelters. Her grandfather is in a wheelchair. What should people do? sit in their houses and wait and pray to God to save them? Why the government don't help us, don't help these people who can't run outside? Her grandmother tells us she refused to leave her husband when the warning sirens sounded. They began again today, a screeching howl riding the wind, sending people running for the closest shelter they could find, us included. The trail of Israel's Iron Dome defense missiles are soon speeding through the sky, looking like stringed confetti. The Iron Dome has a 90% success rate. The people of Gaza have no such defenses. Today, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged both sides to stand down in the fighting, delivering an impassioned plea for the children of Gaza. If there is a hell on earth, it is the lives of children in Gaza today. So, Margaret, how is tonight's news being met by people there? 
Well, we can hear a little bit of celebratory uh, gunfire coming from occupied East Jerusalem tonight. We've seen pictures out of Gaza of people celebrating, pictures in the dark, it must be said, because their electricity has been knocked out. They have endured a dreadful bombing campaign, so natural to see those celebrations. And of course, people in Israel too, especially along the border communities uh, with Gaza, will be feeling a great deal of relief. But scratch below the surface and people on both sides will tell you they know that they're buying time. That unless the root causes of the conflict are addressed, they'll likely wind up right back in the position um, that we've seen them in in recent days. Margaret Evans reporting from Jerusalem tonight. Thank you. Well, tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden said he sees genuine opportunity to build lasting peace in the region. I believe the Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. My administration will continue our quiet and relentless diplomacy toward that end. Biden credited Egypt for brokering the ceasefire, but also said his team was involved in intense hour-by-hour -hour discussions to end the violence. And tonight, Canada's foreign affairs minister tweeted his government's support for the ceasefire, saying Canada calls for a renewed commitment to peace and stands ready to support efforts towards a two-state solution. An Ontario court has found Iran intentionally shot down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 and called it an act of terrorism. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps hit the plane with two surface-to-air missiles on January 2020. All 176 people on board were killed, including 85 Canadian citizens or permanent residents. The Canadian government will soon begin negotiations with Iran on reparations for victims' families. Well, turning to the pandemic now and two very different COVID stories playing out as we approach the long weekend. In Ontario, where cases have been falling, cautious step towards a brighter future. The province laid out a plan for reopening that even permits some outdoor sports this long weekend. But in neighboring Manitoba, a much darker picture. Tighter restrictions are coming into place after a record-setting day of more than 600 new cases. So let's start there in Manitoba with those new restrictions. The timing of them right before the holiday weekend is aimed at stopping a third wave already bad from getting a lot worse. Here's Karen Pulse. Manitobans have been dreaming about the May long weekend, the unofficial start to summer. Today, a cold reality. We know everyone would love to spend uh, the weekend connecting with friends, family and loved ones. Today, we are urging everyone to hang on a little bit longer. The province's chief public health officer was even more blunt. Outdoor gatherings uh, with people from outside of your household will no longer be permitted. Uh, this applies to recreation, uh, playgrounds, golf courses, parks. Sort of boring, yeah. <laughs> I understand indoors, but outdoors, I don't really understand it fully. I don't like them, but I guess you got to do what you got to do to, to get the curve down. That is especially urgent now, as ICU patients are being transferred out of the province to Thunder Bay, Ontario, about 600 kilometres away. We've accepted three patients from Manitoba over the last about 36 hours. We expect to possibly receive another one to two. Three other northwestern Ontario communities are prepared to take an additional 15 patients. Critics say the lack of a proper plan and a delay in implementing tougher restrictions has overwhelmed the health care system. Manitobans are being sent to Ontario because we ran out of the capacity to care for people. When they can't scare you, we win. Part of the problem, some people have resisted the public health orders. Pallister addressed them directly, urging them to follow the rules and get vaccinated. Do it so you can see family and friends. Do it so you can have dinner and a movie. Do it so you can go to church. Do it so you can never give it to anyone else. The Premier says vaccinations are the way out of this pandemic. And tomorrow, Manitobans can start making their appointments for their second shots. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now to Ontario and a roadmap of what a more open summer might look like. But as you'll hear from Olivia Stefanovic, the plan is to move cautiously and there's still one big question left unanswered. Yay, we're open! 
Excitement returning to this golf course empty for weeks during the shutdown. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah, couldn't be sooner. Ontario's measured plan to reopen starts Saturday when outdoor sports like golf and tennis can resume. While now is not yet the moment to reopen the province, today we are releasing our roadmap to reopen. Then about mid-June, people can return to patios and non-essential stores. Indoor services with reduced capacities like hair salons come next. Finally, it will be the turn of indoor settings like gyms and casinos with more people and fewer face coverings. But all that depends on adult vaccination rates, climbing from 60 to 80 percent with one dose and 25 percent with two doses. And this momentum is what gets us to a good summer. The plan seems aligned with new modeling from doctors. Waiting till the middle of June to reopen will likely bring cases down to a very low level. But schools won't open for now. The modeling says it could lead to a rise in cases. When I heard Dr. Brown say it's going to increase cases by 11 percent, um, I, we can't afford an increase of 11 percent right now. Just drag it over to where you need to. Good. Meaning more days like this for the Bradshaw family. Trying to keep them in the house all day. It's like well, you see, you've seen what pinball machines are like. <laughs> Same idea with them. Still, the gradual reopening lets some parents breathe a little easier. It's a relief in a way. It's like a, a like a weight off, weight weight off the shoulders. And all that things are like the the restrictions are going to relax. As cautious as today's plan is, it's welcome news for large parts of a province that have been under lockdown for months. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, I want to bring in Dr. Peter Uni, who is part of Ontario's science table, which has advised government during this pandemic. And the central disconnect here, uh, right, doctor, that the premier has set out a reopening plan, even with rough dates attached, but without giving any indication as to when or if schools would reopen. What do you read into that? Yeah, that's correct. I think it's an excellent reopening plan, but the schools are missing. And that's something that might need to be addressed relatively soon. Because... As a driver of transmission, I mean, the Premier was raising this, this fear that reopening schools could contribute to daily case counts in a meaningful way. Your position on that is what? Well, of course, schools will contribute and the ripple effect of schools opening will contribute to transmission. But, you know, it's probably in, a, in an area that we can handle. We also need to be aware of that Ontario, unlike other places in the world, did a relatively good job. If you compare that with the UK, our way of cohorting kits, of masking kits is much, much better. So probably it can be managed. Should businesses be reopening before schools reopen? It's a, this is a judgment call from our perspective, you know, at the science table, actually not. Okay, we'll leave it there. Dr. Uni, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, some good news on the horizon for British Columbians as that province gets set to unveil its reopening plan next week. They can expect on Tuesday that the circuit breaker will be over and a roadmap will be laid out for all British Columbians to see. But the key there uh, being that Premier Horgan wants the current restrictions to stay until after the long weekend. The province has also opened up vaccine registration for kids 12 and up. Meanwhile, in Alberta, the plea is straightforward. Do not gather with others this long weekend and stay close to home. We are gaining momentum, but it is fragile and we cannot afford to take this weekend off from following the rules. Dr. Hinshaw says rules will ease if enough people get vaccinated. The province also changed quarantine requirements today. If a person's found to be a close contact of a positive case, they will not have to isolate if they've gotten both vaccine doses. But if they've only gotten one dose, they'll still need to quarantine for 10 days. Well, the new head of Canada's vaccination rollout says things are speeding up by the day as more doses pour into the country. Over 2 million Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine doses have gone out in the past three days alone. For Moderna... Today, we received 1.1 million doses that will be delivered to provinces and territories between now and Saturday. That Moderna shipment touched down this morning in Toronto. Canada also received another half million doses of AstraZeneca this week. Officials say Canada is on track to distribute about 40 million doses by the end of June. 
Well, right now, almost half of all Canadians have received at least one dose. But for some, that dose was weeks or even months ago. So with the clock ticking, there's frustration with a lack of information about that crucial second shot. Lauren Pelly spoke to some of those who feel they're stuck in a kind of vaccine limbo. Sit. Rory Armstrong feels left out in the cold. The Edmonton resident had a first vaccine dose in March, but when it comes to booking a second shot, he's heard. Nothing more, nothing further at all. So it's been basically left up to us to follow uh, media reports and uh, whatever uh, information we can gather off the in internet. With the weeks ticking by, he keeps wondering when he'll get the appointment date. We're still in limbo as to what's uh, going to be done. Canadians who've gotten their first shot keep emailing CBC News, asking why people in some regions can't book second doses, or what happens to people who got the AstraZeneca shot, or why some second dose appointments are being cancelled by voicemail. I'm having the same challenge myself. Even this Toronto immunologist hasn't been able to figure out when she'll get that coveted booster. People who don't get their boost for four months will get the benefit of the boost. I'm most concerned about the risk of infection as you're immunity wanes over time. In some regions, many Canadians are already booking or even getting second doses, with the highest rates of full vaccination in the north. Certainly give me a lot less than I'm sure. Federal officials hope that. more supply means less time between rounds. So I think we're on track to, uh, as I say, uh, shorten the interval. Other provinces are allowing bookings soon, including Manitoba, starting tomorrow. We'll be moving to a system based mainly on when people got their first dose. There's also been confusion over whether Canadians who got a first dose of AstraZeneca will get another round. Some provinces are offering the vaccine for second doses, but not Ontario quite yet. That determination has not yet been made. Armstrong got a shot of AstraZeneca himself. Alberta Health told us anyone in that situation will be contacted about getting a second dose when they're eligible. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec announced a major acceleration of its vaccine rollout today. Starting tomorrow, the Pfizer vaccine will be available for teens. The good news is those, those 12, 17 can be vaccinated with their parents in, in cars together in their family bubble. Yeah, they'll have several options to get the shot at any of a number of drive through sites with their parents, as you heard, uh, or they can simply book an appointment starting next week. Well, the Joyce Eshaquan inquiry continued today. She is the First Nations woman who died in a Quebec hospital last fall after being ridiculed by staff who were supposed to care for her. Alison Northcott has the details. Joyce Eshaquan's husband, Carole Dubé, is still looking for answers. Piece by piece, the coroner's inquiry is trying to shed light on what happened at the Joliet Hospital last fall. Today, testimony from a key witness, a nurse heard berating Eshaquan as she live-streamed it. That's just one of the comments on the video. The nurse, whose name is under a publication ban, told the inquiry she was overworked, stressed and hit a breaking point. She broke down in tears as she apologized to Eshaquan's family. I admit it's appalling, she said. I can't watch the video. I hear so much anger in my voice. The patient didn't deserve that. The fact that they are fatigued, surtaxed. The chief of Manawan, where Eshaquan was from, says there's no excuse for the nurse's words. That nurse also testified that her supervisor's response to the video was to assure the nurse that she wouldn't be recognized. After having heard these horrific comments, her only concern was as to whether the nurse would be recognizable or not. Uh, no concern whatsoever for the patient's well-being. And that is absolutely terrible because that goes to show the kind of management culture that allows these problems to be created. Following this morning's testimony, the coroner called for calm from the public after learning some nurses and their families had received death threats. While the inquiry will hear several more witnesses, in Manawan yesterday, a solidarity walk to support Eshaquan's family through the process. That's uh, important for, for them and for us, for the community, to, to know about, uh, about truth. But that truth still feels elusive for Eshaquan's family. In a statement, they said they're left with a feeling of dissatisfaction over a lack of honesty. But they said they will continue to listen until the end. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. 
Well, the BBC is apologizing following an inquiry into the actions of one of its journalists decades ago. The scandal centers on a now infamous interview with Princess Diana. Shocking for what it revealed, but also how it even came to happen in the first place. Tess Arcelia breaks it all down. It was a factor. In it the was an explosive interview. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> Today, 26 years later, an explosive conclusion to an inquiry over whether the BBC's former journalist Martin Bashir secured that exclusive with Princess Diana through deceitful tactics. The verdict? Guilty. The storytellers have become the story. The inquiry found that Bashir seriously breached BBC rules by creating fake bank statements, which he showed to Diana's brother, Charles Spencer, suggesting that staff members were being paid to spy on the princess. Spencer says these were used to gain his trust and led to him introducing Bashir to his sister. I met Martin Bashir on the 31st of August, 1995, because exactly two years later she died. And I do draw a line between the two events. He claims Diana's paranoia, that people were out to get her, were further fueled by insinuations Bashir had made. Out. And today, strong words from Prince William. She was failed not just by a rogue reporter, but by leaders at the BBC who looked the other way rather than asking the tough questions. The BBC launched its own investigation in 1996, but cleared Bashir of any wrongdoing, even calling him an honest and honorable man. A failure, the inquiry found, to uphold high standards of integrity and transparency. It shakes the real core of journalism because people will no longer look to that broadcaster and trust them wholly. From the BBC, a mea culpa. Its director, Tim Davy said the BBC is offering a full and unconditional apology. Bashir also apologized for the fake statements, but has long maintained he did not believe they had any bearing on Diana's decision to give the interview. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts. An interview that exposed certain truths, now shrouded in what the inquiry called serious and unexplained lies. Tessa Arcelia, CBC News, Brussels. Well, the best-selling vehicle in Canada is going electric. It's time to bring the lightning. Next, we'll look at just how significant that shift might be, as well as the potential roadblocks for drivers. The cost of batteries has been prohibitive. As provinces roll out plans to reopen, at issue looks at the political pressure to get it right. And the face-off hockey fans have been waiting decades for. The nerves are there. You can't wait to get things started. The pandemic playoffs reuniting Canadian rivals. We're back in two. Just black here. Really thick smoke. Some frightening scenes from central Manitoba as fires in the province's interlake region force hundreds from their homes. The largest, about 240 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg, is said to stretch more than 80 kilometers. More than 750 people from five First Nations have had to leave their homes as well. Just go inside and have a look. Some 700 evacuees are slowly returning to Fort Simpson in the Northwest Territories, assessing the damage after historic spring flooding forced them from their homes more than a week ago. Officials say more than 30 homes in the community have been considerably damaged. Well, Ford made a big announcement that could have big ripple effects across Canada. It's unveiled an electric version of its F-150. Now, certainly not the company's first venture into this space, but Aaron Collins shows us why this product launch is different. Canada's most popular ride is getting a boost. The Ford F-150 soon available as an EV. It's time to bring the lightning. Build as an electric truck for everyone, the company says this is more than just a product launch. It's a truck that will usher in a cleaner future for our country. That shift matters here too. Ford trucks have been Canada's top selling vehicle for more than a decade. So convincing truck drivers to go electric is key to greening Canada's vehicle fleet. People like Wilf Steinle in the market for a new truck and into the idea of an electric pickup. 
there's such a demand um, and a need for this type of vehicle. So it fills a uh, it fills a really important gap that um, up until now we really haven't had. The Lightning will cost about the same as Ford's gas models, and it'll be able to drive as far as 480 kilometers on a single charge. But finding a place to charge up has long been seen as a barrier to EV adoption. It's something U.S. President Joe Biden plans to tackle head on, promising to build half a million charging stations in the next decade. Look, the future of the auto industry is electric. There's no turning back. But finding chargers isn't the only thing slowing EV adoption in Canada. For many, just finding a vehicle is the issue. Demand often outstrips supply these days. Battery supply is one issue, and that's starting to ramp up. Um, the big barrier to EV adoption up until this point has really been that the cost of batteries has been prohibitive. A Ford won't say how many Lightnings will roll off the line next year, and that number isn't just about selling cars. About a third of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions come from vehicles. And changing that is a key to the country's climate change strategy. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Well, tonight, a playoff puck drop we haven't seen in decades. We've been waiting for this. It's taken 42 years for the forever rivals to renew playoff hostilities. <laughs> Indeed, as the Leafs and the Habs face off, we look at an old rivalry reignited by the pandemic. First, though, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Andrew, tonight we're going to talk about how the provinces are managing expectations and reopenings. I know that there might be some people who want to move faster but we can't risk it right now. The political risks for the premiers. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us right after the break. After a spring of lockdowns and restrictions, premiers are now looking ahead to the summer. Ontario unveiled its gradual reopening plan today, just days after Quebec. This has been done slowly and with extreme caution. I know that there might be some people who want to move faster, but we can't risk it right now. By the end of August, if we reach our goal of 75% of the population over 12 with two doses, masks won't be mandatory in most public places. Alberta promised a detailed plan is to come, but is already bringing back in-person schooling. And Saskatchewan released its vaccine-focused roadmap earlier this month. So in the midst of all this, how are provinces managing people's expectations? What are the political risks that come with laying out these kinds of plans? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Um, let, let's start with Ontario, just because it's the one that came out today. Uh, Premier Ford said he didn't want to move too quickly this time around. He, he seemed to lean uh, perhaps... Uh, surprisingly, very heavily on the science uh, to make those decisions. And I say that because in the past, he, he has not always taken the advice of the scientists that he, that, that, that he was being given. Chantal, how do, how do you think he communicated the message in terms of the, managing people's expectations around this? You're asking me, the person who lives in Quebec, to comment on how yes. that went. Yes. Okay. Uh, from a distance, it seems to me that uh, Premier Ford has been badly shaken by the backlash over his handling of the pandemic and has now relinquished uh, the leadership of the way to go to health authorities. And that would explain in part, for instance, why schools will remain closed in Ontario while they're operating in mm -hmm. Quebec and will be operating in other provinces. Yeah. But that's me sitting from Montreal and comparing but, the two approaches. But that, but that, but that's what I want everybody to compare things with where they are. So let's let's go to uh, Ontario then, Andrew. What what did you make of uh, how this was communicated? And I think the other thing that I, I think might be challenging for governments is the fact that people are doing this on different timelines, right? And just like uh, the restrictions lifting the restrictions will happen differently in different places and the and the outbreak is in different stages in different places sure. uh, I think it's very difficult for them and not to cut them too much slack because it's certainly clear that Ontario uh, erred on the side of recklessness in the past and maybe erring on the side of caution now uh, I think they've got a difficult public relations it's always changing but a difficult public communications task now which is people are champing at the bit for example they're saying we're gonna we're gonna open up tennis courts 
uh, the tennis courts in my neighborhood have been open for some time, whether they were <laughs> legally or not, as are the basketball courts. Mm -hmm. uh, so summer is coming, the weather is warming up, and it's going to be, it, it, it's a difficult thing to tell people, hang on uh, for a bit longer. Particularly when people are hearing, for example, that we have now, we're about to have a, a higher proportion of our population with one dose of vaccine than the United States does. Right. Uh, that, I think, is not necessarily a completely comparable number, partly because we have a much, much lower percentage that have been given two doses. But perhaps more importantly, the United States has a much larger proportion of its population that's been infected. So you're adding up the infected people plus the vaccinated people, they're probably a lot closer to herd immunity than we are. Althea, how, how do you think um, provinces need to balance all of this? Well, I think the need started when Saskatchewan released its reopening plan. And then uh, I think the people uh, are demanding to see light at the end of the tunnel. We've heard that messaging from public health officers, uh, from the premiers themselves. And so it, despite the fact there are different circumstances across the country, uh, you know, people are tuning to the same national news and they are seeing conflicts, uh, conflicting information in different jurisdictions and they want to know uh, when they are possibly going to be able to hug their family members and eat outside and go to picnics. And um, so I, I think there was a need to give people a sense that uh, we need you to hang in there a little bit longer. And this is why. So here's the data mm -hmm. and things will get better. And, uh, and share the information. And for Premier Ford today, I think uh, you alluded to it, and Chantal as well, um, it seems like he, he is heeding the lessons from April when he didn't listen to the science table, and now he is basically taking literally every piece of advice they, have, they laid out for him. Uh, but he is also doing that in a way to share the blame with the science table. It was pr rather peculiar that he did not want to establish a date for sending kids back to school, and that we could possibly find ourselves in a situation where patios are open, but uh, kids are still at home with their parents. Yeah. Uh, Chantal, you wanted in there, I can see. Yes, uh, because uh, on this, I believe that what has paid off for some premiers, including uh, François Legault, is that you understand what their priorities are. And in right. this province, it's always been clear uh, that the premier's priority was to keep schools open. Uh, to the point where a few months ago when it was kind of a, is it a good or a bad decision, he actually said, this is on me. I, that's my priority. And I decided to cut bait on this and keep yeah. the schools open. You don't get that sense when you listen to Premier Ford. Yeah. You get the, a sense of abdication uh, whenever they're unanimous. Well, one, thing's, one of the things we've learned over the past year and a half is that People who work in science are never unanimous, like mm -hmm. columnists or politicians. <laughs> so if you're going to say, let's wait till they all agree on yeah. something, yeah. it's basically, yeah. uh, for me, an abdication of leadership. I, I, I'm, glad also... you're, I'm glad you don't all agree. What would you all do if you all agreed? Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, we've talked about how successful Legault has been in messaging, and part of that is rationality and consistency. You know, when you look by comparison to Ford, People are prepared. There's risk associated with everything, but the course, risks yeah. associated with keeping the schools open compared to the benefits are so different than the risks associated with keeping, let's say, you know, bars open. Yeah. And at one point in Ontario, we had bars open way before they should be, and it was a needless and reckless risk. On the other hand, then you get this overkill in the other direction, where they, they at one point shut down playgrounds or or you know, still to this day, keeping outdoor activities uh, closed when those are the least risky. Last word to you on that, Althea. Well, I think the reason that François Ago has been so successful in Quebec is that even when he makes errors and, you know, the rollout around Christmas was a complete disaster where he kept changing his mind and then eventually had to basically cancel Christmas that he had promised people a month earlier they would have, is that he has said he's sorry. It's on him. He has made mistakes yeah, and he's yeah. been honest with the public. And you get the sense, rather, in Ontario, that Premier Ford is, frankly, scared that he got that the April experience has spooked him and he doesn't want to revisit it again. Yeah. And, and he, he is continuing to point the finger at, at Ottawa for things that it is not doing for the properly, border. according to him. Yeah. So, um, OK, we're going to leave that issue there, but uh, you're going to come back for one more round. We're going to take a look at the prime minister's response to Quebec's language bill. It is uh, perfectly uh, legitimate for a province to modify the section of the constitution that applies specifically to them. The political um, consequences that, that, that or, or maybe benefits of Trudeau's support. Do. That's next. Yeah. 
it is uh, perfectly uh, legitimate for a province to modify the section of the Constitution that applies specifically to them. We will continue to move forward in ways that protect the French language, uh, both in Quebec and across the country. That's the Prime Minister reacting this week to Quebec's Bill 96. That's legislation that would tighten the province's language laws and the claim that Quebec can unilaterally amend the Constitution pertaining to itself. So uh, what does this mean, if anything? Uh, what kind of political uh, risks are here for the Prime Minister, if any? Chantal, Andrew and Althea are back. Uh, Chantal, I'm going to start with you on this one, and that makes lots of sense because <laughs> you're there. What did you make of the Prime Minister's uh, response to Bill 96? It, in particular, I think, the, the constitutional amendment that Quebec wants to put forward. I think we should be careful to note that uh, the Prime Minister argued that that was the legal advice that he had received. So that was his cover for saying that, that his uh, own Justice Department lawyers had said Quebec's route, unilateral route, uh, is actually a doable route. I think that's debatable. Uh, it may be the advice of Justice Department um, lawyers, but others have other views on that. Mm -hmm. What surprised me most, or, or what I found the, the, the most unexpected on the part of Justin Trudeau was in the French answer, where he said uh, that Quebec wanted to write in its section of the Constitution generally agreed concepts, and it is true that Parliament agreed, and he said that Quebec is a nation and that its official language is French. But it was, in my memory, the first time that I heard Justin Trudeau say that uh, he actually agreed with that. He was not an MP when that yes. motion was voted in the House of Commons. And in the leadership, liberal leadership campaign that took place at the same time, he backed a candidate, Gerald Kennedy, who actually was opposed to it. So uh, I think that took people by surprise. Bottom line, the only thing I got from it is that uh, if there's going to be a, a legal fight over this, and I believe there will be, yeah. and the Supreme Court at the end will have the final say, Justin Trudeau or Aaron O'Toole or Jack Mead Singh are not about to lead it. Andrew, you've written on this and, and have many things to say, too. Well, it's, it's premature, to say the least, for the prime minister to be weighing in, even on behalf of unnamed uh, advisors. Uh, when he opens his mouth like that, it has import. It's not just a, a random statement. Uh, and I think uh, there would certainly be a growing number of constitutional scholars who would disagree with him. But obviously, a lot of this is not going to be known for sure until it is tested in the courts. But it's certainly worrisome. And it's worrisome, I think, from a couple of perspectives. One is that it it affects the political landscape and what is possible and what is push, what he can push back on. But secondly, you know, the courts take some of their signals from the political players and particularly in federal mm -hmm. provincial matters. Uh, they, in my observation, uh, tend to favor the, the provincial, provincial side when there's a fight between the provinces and the feds. But they, if, if what they particularly like, though, is if the feds and the provinces agree on something, because that gives them cover. So if you do get into a, a, a debate about the meaning of the Quebec as a nation, Quebecers are a nation uh, clause, for example, and the Supreme Court looks and says, aha, Quebec said, you know, we want to do this, and it, we were hoping that it would have this, this, and this implication, and the federal government and the, all the federal leaders kind of were okay with that. Mm -hmm. Who are we to get in the middle of that? Right. So uh, I, I think it is, uh, I think it was an unfortunate uh, misstep on his part. I think there is a lot that needs to be examined in, in this uh, bill, uh, not only in terms of federal-provincial relations, but in terms of its implications for minority language rights in the province, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I don't think the prime minister needed to get out ahead of it quite quite that, that way. Although politically, we, we can understand why he he maybe yeah. did Althea. I mean, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot riding on Quebec for him and his government. Politically, this is the answer and the message he wanted to send. He does not want to have a fight with Francois de Gaulle in Quebec. And frankly, what's even more surprising is people like Aaron O'Toole and Jagmeet Singh also do not want to weigh in and have agreed with the prime minister's assessment that um, the House of Commons and the Senate Parliament does not need to weigh in on uh, Quebec uh, unilaterally changing a part of the Constitution that deals with English or French, uh, which Section 43 clearly says uh, needs to happen. So um, when you look at the tweets from Conservative MPs, you could see why Aaron O'Toole would not want to have a debate in the House of Commons where some of his Alberta caucus members, not just mm -hmm. Albertans, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, might have some, some uh, concerns about one province, namely Quebec, uh, unilaterally amending the Constitution. 
I think the other thing I'd like to say here is that this whole issue for me has raised the questions of like, who is Justin Trudeau and what are his principles? Back in 2012, when he was running for the Liberal leadership and the PQ was suggesting a revamp bill on 101, he said that this was completely unnecessary, that it was actually going to be a disservice to the Francophone community, that the studies that were showing a decline in the use of French or projected decline were actually just based on birth rates and there was really not much to do about anything. He also came out really strongly against uh, what the Harper government wanted to do on the NECAB ban during the, uh, the 2015 election. And we've heard very little about Bill 21, and now we're hearing very little about Bill 96. Okay, mm -hmm. got to leave it there. And I know we could have talked a lot longer on that. It will come back, I'm sure. Thanks, everybody. Okay, and Rosie, what are you working on for this Sunday's Rosemary Barton Life? Well, we are going to talk a little bit more about those reopening plans in different provinces across the country, Andrew, but we're also going to talk about vaccines and what is really the, the, the plan for second dosing, whether you can mix and match, whether you should go ahead and get your second dose of AstraZeneca. Dr. Howard New will join us to answer some of those questions on Sunday. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Toronto last faced Montreal in the playoffs back in 1979, and Leafs legend Daryl Sittler expects another tough fight. I think it's going to be a good series. Next, an original six battle of more than four decades in the making. Wasn't a hit for Tavares, knocked down by Sherratt, and Tavares is hurt. A well, scary moment on the ice tonight as the Leafs and Habs started their playoff series. John Tavares was taken to hospital after a collision with Corey Perry. But Tavares did give a thumbs up on his way off the ice. Tonight's face-off comes from the NHL's temporary North Division. Canadian teams only set up to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission. But now that the playoffs are here, there is a fan-friendly ripple effect. Long ago, rivalries renewed. Jamie Strachan has a look. As the puck is dropped, and here we go. Few rivalries in sports maintain their intensity through a 42-year drought, but fewer like the Habs and the Leafs. And there's going to be a penalty to William. Before tonight, they last met in the playoffs in 1979. <laughs> then Leaf captain Daryl Sittler scored a goal in the series. But the mighty Canadians swept the series. There were uh, a couple overtime games, the shots were close, so it could have gone either way, but they were just, uh, they were the best team in the league that time, and they proved it so, and they won four cups in, uh, in a row. It wasn't always that way. Toronto beat Montreal in 1967, the team's last Stanley Cup victory. Just another chapter in a rivalry that dates back more than a century. I remember interviewing Rocket Richard in 1989, and I remember asking him about the rivalry he had with Ted Lindsay and Gordy Howe and that Montreal-Detroit rivalry. I'm telling you right now, I can close my eyes and see him shake his head at me and say it wasn't even close to what we had with Toronto. He's got an opportunity with the open net and the Jets have a 4-1 In Western Canada, another old playoff rivalry is already underway. Every time the Oilers won the Stanley Cup, they went through Winnipeg. But it started even before that. And the final score, Winnipeg 7, Edmonton 3. I would say Edmonton for sure would be the most natural rival. That goes back to the WJ days. Let's not forget, when you're talking about city rivalries, that the Jets beat the Oilers in the last WJ year to win the Apple Cup. Trying to split the D and scores! COVID restrictions meant keeping Canada's teams in one division this season, leading to a renewal of old matchups. Hockey fans aren't complaining. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, up next, a birthday wish come true. A little girl's party was cancelled due to the pandemic, but that's when mom got an idea. Well, Abigail Dukes was looking forward to a bowling party to celebrate her fourth birthday, but when COVID cases started rising in Nova Scotia, her family had to call it off. So her mom reached out to friends and family to send their well wishes instead to little Abby. And what she got was a lot more than she ever could have hoped for. It's our moment. Go, go! I called it the Abby Love Project, uh, just to show her how far mommy's love can go. 
And I was hoping like family from Canada and stuff like that, friends from Facebook would be able to help out because we're all spread everywhere. So we wanted to like explain to her like they're still good, like things can still, big things can still happen for your birthday. And she didn't believe me. <laughs> so I told her I'd show her how big love can spread and it's better than any of the bad that's going on and it turned into a worldwide thing. The word went on. We got uh, photos from Norway, from Australia, from the North Pole, Bermuda, Thailand. It's, I was shocked. <laughs> We've got probably about 60, 65 photos, some from the same areas, but it's gone worldwide. <laughs> so you see the world map there, right? They, they have a whole plan. They're going to stick all those photos, print them out, try to stamp, uh, stick them to the map so that they have those memories to last for a long time. But let me add one more. Abigail, happy birthday from the National. You're awesome. That's the program for this May 20th. Have a great night.